Hi, I'm Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Shams. And I'm Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. I'm a blur with a love for artwork and comics and animation. And I'm a writer and blurred with a love for pretty much the same things. We grew up together and spent much of our formative years watching and talking about DC superhero shows and content. In fact, we still do. Every episode, we will discuss a DC production, compare it to its original source material, and share our thoughts on the adaptation. We've enjoyed our conversations these past couple of decades, and we think you will too. This season, we're looking at 16 years of DC animated movies to see which stories are sweet and which ones are sour on yet another DC animated podcast, part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Welcome to yet another episode of yet another DC animated podcast. My name is Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Shams. And I am Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. Andrew and I have known each other since 1996. That was the year you know Pokemon Green dropped on the Game Boy. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Pokemon Green itself. Uh, those are the great, greatest, greatest Pokemon games I think have ever been created. I, I was a Pokemon Yellow man, though, because oh. I had the yellow Game Boy color, so it had to be monochromatic. As soon as I had any other game, it like threw me off. It took, it took me longer to play these games, but Pokemon Green with that Bulbasaur, not Bulbasaur, Venusaur. Oh, yeah. Legit. Legit. Mm. Like, I, if we understood Japanese, you would have definitely been over it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Well, we're talking about that green. Um, wow, this, I just realized, like, green could have very different meanings right now. When I talk oh, about oh that. yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Hotbox edition of the DC Animated <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Uh, no, but we are talking about that green because we are talking about the greenest hero in the DC universe. Uh, well, one of the greenest heroes. There's a lot of green heroes. As we talk about Green Lantern, Emerald Knights. At a runtime of 84 minutes, this film is directed by Lauren Montgomery and Jay Olivia, who are working side by side on this DC Entertainment Warner premiere film. We're still back in our Warner premiere days. Uh, it's a PG rated film, just to get our minds right about it. So if there's anything that is a little too far uh, <laughs> we will comment on it or switch up the language <laughs> I, I just straight up feel as a general statement i feel like warner brothers lies about the ratings on all of the movies <laughs> <laughs> the constitutes to the demons oh yeah that's rated g <laughs> yeah <laughs> fun for the whole family <laughs> <laughs> you know just go into a pool it could be a pool of dead bodies but you never know yeah. um <laughs> so Although they are sharing a very similar design, similar like style of setup, this movie is a, um, by which I mean, we did have a Green Lantern film originally, like two years prior to this, we did have Green Lantern First Flight. That was the origin story of Hal Jordan. This time around, we get like, more or less the origin story of almost every single Green Lantern ever created almost. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but they kind of counted this one at one point was trying to count it as a sequel to the Green Lantern First Flight, even though there's some drastic continuity issues. Sinestro for one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know what happened there. But so today, I guess it's kind of like our um, kind of like Hulk and Incredible Hulk. I'm pulling this from our um, our members from our Forgotten Entertainment family from yet another MCU podcast in which they had called it a requel, a reboot, and a sequel all at the same time. <laughs> all right, so it's now time for the cast of Green Lantern Emerald Knights. Um, we got a large cast today because it is the Green Lantern core, so we'll go through this pretty quickly. As we have Nathan Fillion, who is our Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. Um, <laughs> We also have Elizabeth Moss, who is voicing Green Lantern um, Aresia. Um, you'll know Elizabeth Moss from Handmaid's Tale, which is what America is now greenlighted as their ad adaptation, I guess, in the, from 2016 to now. <laughs> yeah, this season of Black Mirror is crazy. <laughs> I also didn't realize it was going to last longer than Phase 4 of Marvel, but like, hey, here we go. <laughs> um, and you would think that after his time as a Death Eater, that Lucius Malfoy might have gone into a role to do some good. However, we have Jason Isaac coming back here as Sinestro for our film. 
Uh, this person, though, did learn the villain lesson of going from villain to hero, as you have Arno Vosloo, who is also known as Imhotep from the Mummy series, as he voices Avin Sir. Yes. And then we got Henry Rollins, who voices Kilowog, a role that he took some time between voicing Johnny Rancid on the Teen Titans animated series as a here from Legend of Korra. Legend. Just a, <laughs> just a freaking legend. So good. I was not expecting that at all. Um, then we got, you know, he was quite rowdy as the voice of Balfunga. Um, so shout out to the late pro wrestling Hall of Fame Rowdy Roddy Piper for voicing this. I think personally it was one of my favorite stories actually <laughs> in this film. And finally, you know her face and her fighting skills from Arrow as China White. Uh, her voice is Lady Shiva and Cheshire in DC Animated Universe productions, as well as Stacy from Phineas and Ferb. And today you will know her name as Kelly Hugh, who is voiced in Lyra in our uh, Green Lantern Emerald Knights film today. Stacked lineup. I love it. Yep. All right. So now that the lineup is all set, it's time to jump into our film for today, Green Lantern Emerald Knights. So right away, I will give this big positive right off the bat. The animation here is incredible. Mm -hmm. They really went all out, um, which is definitely appreciated for a character, Green Lantern, who sad. the sad fact is you're never really going to get a live action adaptation that can capture everything the Green Lantern is capable of until we make some another really big advancement in CGI. I think you just can't reach that level of imagination and creativity. So it's really great that they took the time to make this animation so crisp and clean mm -hmm. and immediately use it to kill somebody. <laughs> you had to make it memorable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we immediately lose one of our Green Lantern members. Um, she is attacked by uh, apparently the sun is shooting out antimatter due to this uh being called Krona, who is a um i don't want to spend too much time on him during the comic section so i'll just say it now he is another one of the guardians that was um turned into um in the villainous way so the guard the rest of the guardians trapped him within the antimatter universe and now he's trying to break out and he sends out these like i don't know like death get death ghost i can't remember what they actually called them during the film but i think shadow demons it I... sounds like jackie chan adventures but... yeah <laughs> well you know we're gonna give them a name anyway uh mm -hmm. let's see space dementors uh i don't know uh <laughs> i think space ghost is taken so we can't go that <laughs> can't do space ghost um <laughs> who's who's that guy who does all the antimatter stuff in crisis on infinite earths who's that guy Oh, the, the anti-monitor? Yeah. Uh, anti, uh, I think there's something there. Anti-monster. Anti-monster. <laughs> <laughs> These anti-monsters. Let's do it. The anti-monsters <laughs> are on the prowl. As apparently they have the special skill that whenever they touch anything from the positive matter universe, they immediately destroy it like it is a, I don't know, you're, you're mixing acid on top of like a mr clean magic eraser and we unfortunately do lose this green lantern so now it is time for the rest of the green lanterns as kilowog who has been watching this all go down um decides to rally the troops because it's now time for them to meet on oa charge their batteries and this is when we get our first introduction of basically the staple green lanterns that we know and love of hal jordan kilowog and newcomer orisia rob who is um, kind of low-key worried about the fact that she's going up against these anti-monsters that can like basically touch and destroy her. Yes, so she is concerned because she is a new recruit. And um, this is where we kind of mentioned something about continuity. So in the first Flight movie, um, she is one of the Green Lanterns that actually shows up to confront Hal when he mm. gets the ring. And now she is his um, mentee. So mm -hmm. that kind of re immediately rules out any chances that this could be a sequel of some sort, among many other reasons, but that's the main <laughs> reason. So we find out that uh, Krona created this antimatter universe. And, you know, in any superhero product, you don't want to hear the phrase antimatter universe because that means a big fight against somebody who's impossible to beat. And 
The Guardians apparently turned him into energy and cast him throughout the cosmos. Why didn't y'all just kill this fool? Right, I don't understand. <laughs> why, I feel like this keeps happening, and I'm just like, you know how I many problems could have been solved if we, if we, if we just like, you know, quickly unalive one of these characters? Because I feel like they can't be surviving all these like cosmic energy sh shit that, you know, the Green Lanterns and the Guardians can actually do. <laughs> exactly. I think that's a huge, huge waste of time for them. Just, just send these guys into the sun from the jump. But in any case, they, they decide the best thing to do is to keep track of the situation. So <laughs> they send a bunch of Green Lanterns to just hang out by the sun, which I just find <laughs> hilarious. I, it's like, this is so a cool. paid vacation, y'all. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> just chill by the sun for a little bit. And meanwhile, they tell everybody to go and get their rings charged. It's going to be a crazy journey. And while they're online to get the rings, Hal mentions offhand that um, Aresia is kind of like this Green Lantern Avra because she's so nervous. She's so unsure that she's meant to wield the ring. And he says, you know what Avra was like? And we get our first and certainly not our last long flashback sequence of the movie. <laughs> Yes. Now, just to prepare, uh, pre prepare everyone here. Um, you know how we talked about then got Batman Gotham Knight. It was like basically intertwining short stories. Um, same concept. We are just gonna get a bunch of stories of different Green Lanterns throughout history, starting with this one with Afra as the Guardians of the Universe. I realized like, was that called the Guardians of the Galaxy at one point? <laughs> Well, the uh, the guardians of the universe here, they now realize that shit's hit in the fan with the um, the Dominators, a classic DC alien race villain set of villains who are trying to um, destroy and take over the universe. So the guardians decide to create a weapon from ultimate will, which happens to be the uh which for some reason is the color green in the dc universe and this ends up being also the lantern from the power they were able to create four rings of power um not no connection as far as we can tell to anything from amazon productions of legends of not sorry elite whatever the, whatever it's called lot yeah lord, of the rings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah lord of the rings so it's like so many l's in fantasy stuff so rings choose their their bearer so we see some people get chosen some of them are like the most um the most like what looks like the best warriors the most athletic warriors there's one that i swear looks like the um the avatar spirit um so shout out again to oh rava. Right here yes rava it looks so much like rava and finally the one last green lantern to get chosen before as it looks like it's flying over to the to like the beefiest dude out of this list. And now actually heads over to Avra, who is described for the Guardians, who just basically documents the history of what the Guardians do, especially now that they've brought together these Green Lanterns. And everybody just looks at Avra in shock because they're like, how can this small itty bitty scribe be even helpful in any kind of battle? Yeah, and I do like... Um... I do like this line they say where he feels like it's an accident and they say mm -hmm. accident is only the will of the universe expressing itself. I think that's a really, really powerful line. And I, I like the, uh, the notion of that and what, what mm -hmm. that means. And even though, yeah, he is just a scribe, they're like, yeah, we got to go fight. So, um, <laughs> so they fly into this dominator fleet and it's clear that they are overwhelmed. There's just way too many of them. And all they're doing is shooting beams of green light. They're not really doing too much um, else with it. And they eventually lose a lantern and just want to kind of throw in the towel. Um, and Avra is like, nah, no, nah, we, we're not done yet. If, if we can... If these rings can manifest will, then we can will ourselves not to die, which is pretty gangster, not going to lie. Mm, yeah, word. So word. he goes out and he creates the first construct. And I really thought, I think that's a cool little piece of mythology that 
constructs were not automatic, that people didn't mm -hmm. think of that right away, but it became a core of what the Green Lantern Corps is about, creating constructs. So they just go out creating constructs and going crazy. I like when Rava turns into like a drill and like- Oh my God, yeah, that was like really awesome for no reason, but <laughs> it was really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. And they eventually turn the tide and claim the day of victory. And this leads into Avra and the rest of the Green Lanterns returning back, um, the three of them, they return back and they share their story about what happened. And then this leads into um, how then explaining that with time, Green Lanterns were, um, new Green Lanterns were chosen. Like some of the original ones, they passed on their power to somebody else or um, the, the Guardians created a new set of rings. And through that, Avra is seen now training every single one of these new Green Lanterns to create these constructs. And this is, again, just adding some more of that mythology of the Green Lantern Corps to then share, like, this is the standard operating procedure of the team. So then we see now that, like, he mentions that just like with the rest of the Green Lanterns, with their powers passing on, Avra also had a similar thing. As we get a flash through, of every single Green Lantern that has gotten that ring from Avra. And we wrap it up with Avin Sur getting that ring, who we know ultimately is succeeded by Hal Jordan. And that story gives um, Aricia like a new sense of hope because she's like, okay, cool. Like there's definitely a long lineage of, of like Green Lanterns within not only Hal's ring, but in my ring too. Like, these rings were given to us for a reason. We were chosen for a reason. Just because you may seem scrawny or you may have no fighting power like Avra doesn't mean that you can't pull off the biggest moves. And now she's feeling a bit more confident in herself. Yeah, and uh, at this point, I was uh, pretty, pretty like into it. I liked the this sense of mythology mm -hmm. about the Green Lanterns. I liked the the history, the symbolism, and I was ready for them to go after these anti-monsters. I was ready for the fight after this, <laughs> but not so soon because yeah. Aresia bumps into Kilowog, who's being a little aggressive on the line. And she mentions that he, Kilowog shared a rumor that Kilowog killed somebody during training. And that prompts him, Hal Jordan to be like, <laughs> no, no, Kilowog's not that kind of guy. And we head into another flashback about Kilowogs. <laughs> <laughs> this one, uh, I mean, just appropriately called Kilowog, as for some reason now we see Kilowog's kind of like first day of, of training slash boot camp as he is um, being trained by uh, Sergeant Deacon. He's joined by two other Green Lanterns plus um, Tomar Ray. Um, who's another Green Lantern that we, another famous Green Lantern who is kind of like that fish face, um, had a very great thing happen, scene happen in the Young Justice this recent season. If you mm -hmm. haven't seen it, check it out. So as Sergeant Deegan, Sergeant Deegan is basically that dude from Full Metal Jacket. Like he is screaming in everybody's face. He's calling everyone a poozer, which we find out for the first time, a poozer is just basically someone he sees as not being be able to stick um, to stay up to the task of being the hero and the soldier within the Green Lantern Corps. And Deegan shows that he will fully test you to your absolute limits. As the first thing that happens is their first training is to try to escape an active volcano that's about to explode in like three, two, one. Yeah, and it's very close before Kilowog almost becomes a pig roast and we almost get some filet of fish <laughs> out of Tomar Ray. <laughs> he got very close, but throughout the challenge, Kilowog puts himself at the base to try to get his fellow Green Lanterns out. Is And he's always very focused on helping those out, all the other ones. And then Deegan says, hey, you know, sorry, that was a little hot. Let's get cold. And... <laughs> Let's cool down a little bit and takes them to the middle of a desert um, where they almost drown in what looks like the Sarlacc pit. Mm -hmm. um, but right when it seems like Tomar Ray is done for, Kilowog dives in, saves him, and 
kind of gets a little note of respect from Deegan. But this doesn't calm down their relationship at all, surprisingly. In fact, things get even more heated. Yes, because by the time that it's now time for them to take their mandatory Green Lantern Corps 20-minute break, um, Kilowog is like, he really starts to question Deegan. He's like, are you really willing to kill us? Because you know that if you kill one of us during these trainings, then that's murder. And Deegan then shares that even though he is half the size of Kilowog, that the hands are rated E for everyone and are 50% off and Kilowog has his coupon. <laughs> and I love this fight, to be honest. <laughs> it was the most random fight I didn't expect to see in this film, especially because I always picture Kilowog as that dude um, who, for me, I feel like he's my most Jack character of this film because Kilowog has always been a guy that I've never seen fail or lose a fight. So to see him get mollywopped in his early years <laughs> was hilarious. Yeah, and I love that. They, they, they ain't no bell, they ain't no rings. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also we should, we did forget to mention, but uh, they... All, all of their rings had been stripped at this point. They did all mm-hmm. these challenges without their rings. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now they get a distress call where all their rings are given back. Deegan drops Kilowogs on the ground. Little great, little character beat there. And they go into this, the middle of this crazy conflict. And it is not going well. They're, the trainees are told just to protect the civilians. Deegan is pretty much taking them the enemy forces on single-handedly even he uses a super saiyan 4 final flash but it really doesn't do it they it doesn't do it it doesn't do the trick so he gets injured during this crazy um during this crazy conflict and it it's not looking too good for the green lantern team yeah like i'm already hearing deegan's theme song playing in the background as he's sitting (laughs) on the ground it's like that anime flute <laughs> it's it's over for my man Deegan, and it looks like it might be over for for the Green Lanterns and this group of um, aliens that they're trying to save. But then Kilowog flies in, and man, my boy went off. Like everybody got got a chance to get like to meet Kilowog up close and personal in this one. He is throwing hands. He is throwing uh, constructs. He's throwing energy blasts. And all while he's like trying to protect Deegan and he ultimately decides that the only way that he can do so is to release a taser sweep, which I didn't think was a thing in like Green Lantern, like vernacular. But this thing is just basically the spirit bomb meets an atom bomb fused together as it takes out every single member of the attacking alien force. Yes, this is the ultimate move that he was charging up his combo meter for, and it works brilliantly. <laughs> and at the end of the battle, he goes to Deegan. And in another nice little beat, Deegan clarifies, he's like, I would not have let any of you die. Mm-hmm. Believe me, I just wanted you to push to your limits so that you wouldn't die out here. And he refuses any medical help. Instead, he chooses to use his green blood to draw a lantern on Kilowog, which is, first of all, unsanitary. Right. <laughs> like, I don't think that's proper practice and procedure in the Green Lantern Corps. Like, I, that's not that violates health code violation. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you know, with the rings, they could just put on the, they could construct the lantern. You don't need to do right. that before he does. Uh, but he does do it. And <laughs> as uh as he puts Deegan in a really nice coffin mm-hmm. but I wonder if it lasts forever or if it fades away eventually I, I don't know how constructs like that work I mean as long as Kilowog got the willpower and I feel Kilowog got the willpower that thing's gonna be around for a while <laughs> yeah <laughs> so he takes charge he calls his fellow recruits poosers and tells them to get to work to clean up the city which brings his story to a close and now now that Kilowog's story is done we know the story of Kilowog we know the story of the first Green Lantern we're ready to see what's going on with these anti-monsters so they go to a sun base and they see another Green Lantern Lyra 
Uh, and she's kind of sensing the evil. She's kind of feeling things out. So they're like, okay, yeah, if something is going to go wrong, she knows it. And they're like, oh, how do you know? It's like, well, let me tell you about Lyra. <laughs> and here's your third extended <laughs> flashback, guys. Uh, so in a galaxy far, far away, a long, long time ago, there was a princess. And that princess was Lyra. <laughs> Uh, she came from a warrior race from the home world of Jade, which um, eventually she gets sent on her first solo Green Lantern mission to check in on this like another alien race that apparently has been destroyed by her former by her home world. Um, fun little fact it is actually the same alien race that was attacking Kilowog. So I don't know if these like events are happening at the same time in these flashbacks or what. It'd be wild <laughs> if they did. Yeah, it's like too much storytelling, actually, guys. <laughs> so um, Lyra, she is she sees like a ship from her home world and she's greeted by um, I'm also really confused about who this person was. Like, it seemed like her it stepmom. Was, like, yeah, it was her stepmom who was the same age, like way to go to fall into the 90s trope. But yeah, <laughs> I yeah, I think it was her stepmom. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about loving her dad and I don't think it was her sister. Yeah, and they Unless were talking about. Sister? I hope no, it was not because they were talking about sharing beds, and I was right. like, <laughs> I was right. like, I mean, you should only be sharing beds if it's like, I I don't know what. Yeah, why? I mean, this is a PG film. Why would you be sharing? <laughs> well, that, we there's there's some questions about that. So this leads into a confrontation between the two. Is now Lyra is being decides to just like head on back home to in terms of like going through the ship to find out like where what is actually the deal to go speak with her father and she gets like a mini family reunion all of whom want to kill her <laughs> yeah and um i'll say her fight against her golden stepmom is pretty fun to watch there's a lot of cool aerial combat there's a lot of dynamic animation it kind of feels like you know um a real cool anime space battle mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and once she has beaten the snot out of her stepmom, oh no, um, she. <laughs> <laughs> I said it in the reverse order so that we don't get like blocked. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, we're still PG. Still PG here. <laughs> she uh, gets down to Earth for another exciting battle against her invisible step. Not step, bro. It's her regular <laughs> brother. <laughs> She gets into a fight oh. um, <laughs> with her, her brother who is <laughs> invisible. And uh, this is not a thrilling fight because basically she just does exposes the invisibility and it's pretty instant mm -hmm. um, that it that she wins. It's pretty much instant KO. So now she goes to confront her father. And this one is a weird confrontation i think in my opinion just because um you know everybody has come to as soon as they see her they're ready to fight he seems to be more of a recluse like it makes it seem like he's being almost like held there against his will but as the two of them are start start to talk this is what she's realizing that her father is the one that basically orchestrated the massacre that we had just we saw the aftermath of at the beginning of her story um, he then starts to share that he is basically angry over the fact of actually being seen as less of a man. It, he doesn't say it quite like that, but it does end, end up being like that because he recounts to her the story of um, when she first became a Green Lantern and how when they were first attacked by the, um, the alien race, the um, Kundians, I think they were called. They were at a point where they were they like he was about to be killed. They had they were they basically lost their home world, and he was coming up point blank to to the weapons of the Kundians. But then, luckily for them, at that moment, their Green Lantern of their sector flew in, was able to to help. Unfortunately, he also lost his life there, and this is when the ring flew off of this Green Lantern's hand. And made its way over to Lyra, turning her into the Green Lantern of her of this sector that also included the home world of Jade. And he was proud. Her father was proud for a hot second. He was like, yes, you know, like, this is it. This is the time we could turn the battle and truly gain back our honor. But instead, not only is he upset that he didn't get the ring, but he's also upset that 
she ended up calling for help from the rest of the Green Lanterns, the Green Lantern Corps, who came down as a full army and took down the Cundians from taking over the home world of Jade. And this has created this animosity that he's had towards Lyra and the Green Lantern Corps since then. So we should also need to mention that that was done through another flashback within. Oh, a yes. <laughs> um, I don't want us to lose that. Um, just in case you, uh, just in case you're losing count, we're on our fourth flashback. <laughs> Uh, so we go back to the present, and this is another pretty well choreographed fight. Where wait, is it the present or the fla- or the past present? Sorry, we're in the past <laughs> present. Thank you, thank you. I was getting mm-hmm. lost there. Uh, so we're in the past present, and we get a pretty cool fight because Lyra is quite creative with her constructs. She used the rope and dagger weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, something you've seen in Shang Chi, mm-hmm. and as they're fighting, there are these like memories that are like alien memory crystal things that are playing in the background so you can see kind of you know them as father and daughter as when she was a child having these sweet memories while they're fighting so that's a really creative idea that I, I like them throwing in there and then as after Lyra is injured she gets stabbed in the shoulder he the father gets a hand in the ring and you know he gets to get the ring he always wanted but it rejects him it destroys his perfect armor that was shielding him so he's like well that's it for me and decides to just unalive himself right then and there because he has no ring he has no honor and he sees in this moment his daughter is the one that people should look to and it shouldn't be him he shouldn't be leading this anymore so he yields and dies and i guess his daughter it's implied that his daughter is supposed to become royalty but then she just does some green lantern stuff that's where i was unclear <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is very it doesn't end well um because we it is left very ambiguous of like it's clear that she decided to go back to the green lanterns because i mean that was a story from the past and in our present time she is with the green lanterns ready to fight against krona so um, I this is like one of those cases where it's just like you led the revolution and now we have no idea what to do. So yeah, I'm, I'm a, it's a little confusing as to the aftermath. I guess maybe they just accepted her as the um, Green Lantern in the sector and decided that like yeah, we'll call we'll call for help if we ever need it. Like I, I don't know how many more of them are left, but yeah, no, Jade, um, Lyra will be there to help. So as I mentioned, the we get back to the present where once again they are monitoring the sun to see when Krona will come out and it's now turned into an all hands on deck um cold red or situation because even though nothing's really happening they're just like they just want to be ready and no everybody's talking about like oh yeah like this person's here that person's here but uh wait a minute um where's Mogo and Hal decides that um you know what we are going to talk about Mogo as we jump into our next flashback story of why Mogo doesn't socialize. All right, we're in flashback number five. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, what is time? <laughs> so, okay, now we get uh, Bola Funga. That's the guy's mm-hmm. name. Bola Funga, yeah. He's this great warrior. He loves killing. He just loves killing. Like that one character from Rick and Morty. I just love killing. Um, <laughs> oh boy, here I go killing again. And he comes up against an enemy and an enemy's like, oh, you're pretty good. You chopped off some of my limbs, but you're not good enough for Mogo. And this guy's like, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me where Mogo is. So he is... This the warrior Bolfunga um, goes to another planet, um, and he says he he uh, sends out these probes to find Mogo. So right here, if you before we get into it for this one, if you know the twist here already, this might this section might go on for a little bit too long, mm-hmm. um, like it did for me, but. Uh, <laughs> He sends out the probes and tries to find this Mogo guy. Yeah, and they're looking. They have um, the the running joke is that it keeps saying that Green Lantern energy detected as Bofunga is just like, 
basically chopping down trees trying to find this green lantern because again we're thinking of this anthropomorphic being flying around somewhere um paul funga eventually is feeling very just like he's been trapped on this world for like i think it was like first it was days now it's weeks and he's getting tired of it so he decides to pull one final thing in which he sends out all of his probes to um, do a full scan of the entire planet and for each time that they finish scanning a sector they will leave an explosive behind in order to flush mogul out because he thinks that mogul is hiding in like this entire time but then as he's ready to push the button as the the bombs are ready to go off all the grass on on the planet starts like destroy the bombs leaving nothing at all and this is when bofunga realizes that mogo isn't a green lantern on the planet mogo is a is mogo is the planet and mogo is a green lantern and there's no way that he can even like take on this formidable foe so he tries to escape but mogo is like no 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 get over here come here boy get over here we have <laughs> we have something to talk about as our short ends up wrapping here with Bolfunga um basically disappearing from the them from the timeline we we don't know what happened to Bolfunga after this i'm a little worried about this what this planet did <laughs> yeah i don't i think that's why i don't hang out with mogo a lot because mm-hmm. he disappears people mm-hmm. so that's it <laughs> for that flashback <laughs> so now finally we're back to our where we're here for the anti-monsters it is time yes. for us to get to the anti-monsters the big fight all the green lanterns are assembled we know everybody and as we see them confronting the monsters for the first time, Sinestro comes in and says, hey, Aresia, pretty, pretty crazy what's going on out there, right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty crazy. And he's like, I ever tell you about my boy, Avisor? <laughs> <laughs> and a six flashback begins. Yeah, one, le- one quick thing before. He also tells her that um, Oa is destined to be destroyed. And then he's like, here's how I found out about this. <laughs> As we jump into Avin Sur's story, um, Avin Sur is the Green Lantern who had the ring before Hal Jordan. Um, he ends up in a fight against this being called Atrocitus. For Green Lantern DC fans, I'm pretty sure that everybody's like, oh my gosh, Atrocitus. He is nowhere near what he actually ends up becoming. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the future so we could we had to take several seats back um and it's this alien that apparently has escaped a prison from ismalt um he escaped the prison transfer that was happening there and he tells abin sir that he has the ability to see the future kind of like see the darkness of the future and gives him about uh, about three warnings and they're all something that Avin Sir decides to listen to because, again, just like us, he is trapped in this flashback. Yes. So, yeah, so Avin Sir listens just like we have to to these warnings, one of which, as we learn from Sinestro, is that Oa is destined to be destroyed. Um, and the other two are that Avin Sir will die. This is, again, if you know your Green Lantern stuff, this is something that you just know. And then finally, that um, Avin Sir's greatest ally, which should be in Sinestro, is destined to betray him and to betray the Green Lantern Corps. Now, Avin Sir is like, these are great stories. I, um, I love what you're trying to do, but uh, you know, I can tell that these are just works of fi- fiction that you've put together. As he is now locking up um, Atrocitus on his malts again. This is when uh, Sinestro also joins in, and the two of them, Sinestro and Alvin Sir, have a conversation about uh, destiny and luck. Which, to be honest, I did not need to have this part in this movie. <laughs> yeah, it's like we all, you know, he says, Sinestro, you're going to become the master of fear, or whatever. Um, we know. <laughs> yeah, we it's know. like the SNL skit. Like we know this. <laughs> yeah. We've already we we know where Sinestro is going, guys. Right. And the fact is, in this movie, he's not evil. 
So, like, unless they had intended for this movie to to be followed up with the sequel immediately, it makes no sense to spend mm-hmm. as much time as they do setting up Sinestro as this big evil bad guy because we're not going to get to see it. Um, so, after this flashback, after these predictions, after we leave this hell prison... No joke, it's finally time for them to fight the (laughs) anti-monsters. And the Green Lanterns don't do well. They get overwhelmed. They cannot defeat Krona and everything. And in a cool, like, little image, Krona, like, claps his hands, essentially. And all you see is a bunch of rings. Mm -hmm. So you know it is, it's looking bad. And that's when Aresia steps up and says... But what if we throw a planet? And I was so sitting there like, <laughs> where are you going with this, Aris? It's like, this don't make no sense. Where are we going yeah, is there planet? anything else? Or <laughs> no? Just can I get points to your plan? <laughs> nope. Just throw Oa. That's her plan. Mm. Throw Oa. So yeah, Krona, who is our most jack character of this film, um, gets a planet, gets Oa thrown directly at him. And, of course, he, because he is the most Jet character, he is able to hold back the planet until another planet joins the battle. As we have Mogo, the living planet, who joins in with his own Green Lantern energy blast along with the rest of them to continuously push Oa towards Krona so that he can be destroyed between the sun and the and the planet itself. And this is literally the definition of being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. So then eventually Krona starts like, one of the things I was really pissed about is because like Krona is definitely trying to break apart the planet that he is being, that's being thrown at him. But again, it's not enough. It's too much power being pushed onto him as he evaporates into dark antimatter dust alongside his anti-monsters as now the movie ends with the Green Lantern celebrating in space, they decide to all land on Mogo, the living planet, which Mogo somehow okayed the Guardians to use as a temporary base for, for um, the Green Lantern Corps until the Green Lanterns rebuild Oa. And part of me is like, are, are you just going to take over another planet? in mm-hmm. order to? Okay, cool. That's how that works. Cool. Uh, <laughs> And now it ends with um, them looking at the the book of Oa that tells basically this is where they were getting all these stories from. And Aresia's plan to throw the planet at Krona, prophes- completing the prophecy that um, Atrocitus has shared about Oa's destruction, it gets written into the book of, book of Oa as our movie ends very much like, uh, um, what was it, um, Star Wars, um, the Return of the Jedi, everybody's celebrating in the forest as they all fly off and Aresia gets warned once again that it's time for her to report for Kilowatt's training. Oh, and now we get our Hal Jordan section. <laughs> uh, just kidding. The, the, there's not- <laughs> no, he did prep it. He was like, did I ever tell you the story about how I teamed up with a squirrel? And I was like, we know this and we don't want this. <laughs> no, that's not that's not what we came here for. <laughs> All right, so that is the end of Green Lantern Emerald Knights, um, a movie with so many flashbacks and stories that the only thing I can say is um, before we give our sweet and, or, and sour review, uh, here is another story of a podcast that you should be listening to <laughs> when you're not listening to one of ours from the Forgotten Entertainment family. Hi, I'm Mike Phil. I'm Mike Butler. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Generic Ad. Join us every Wednesday as we talk about films that seem to be forgotten by audiences, whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time or the film simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the film, maybe don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. You never know, you might find your own forgotten gem. Forgotten Cinema is available wherever you get your podcasts or at ForgottenCinemaPodcast.com or ForgottenEntertainment.com as we are a proud part of the Forgotten Entertainment family i swear i talk more in the episodes all right now it's time for is green lantern emerald knights sweet or sour ah this is a sour yellow lemon the antithesis (laughs) of the green lantern core here's my thing i've said it once i'll say it a thousand times 
if you have a bunch of shorts that go together by connected by a theme and you want to release them all tell us that you have six shorts that you'd like <laughs> to release seven if you include the actual stuff in present time mm -hmm. because as a as the individual shorts they each some have merits like i think the uh the short with lyra was an interesting political situation with some mm -hmm. great fight scenes and then kilowogs is a great origin story for him and avra was cool to get that like green lantern lore about constructs mm -hmm. but together they don't work they just don't work together when you wrap all of this around the premise of these anti-monsters trying to take over the universe you need to have the flashbacks build towards it otherwise it feels like they're not really happening for a reason so it, it just builds up the momentum of the the main movie plot momentum stops every time one of these flashbacks begins mm -hmm. not allowing you to really settle or get invested in what's happening because you've forgotten what's happening because three flashbacks ago that the shadow <laughs> anti monsters were not a d a problem so purely because this could have been a shorts <laughs> this could have been disconnected shorts and dc has done this before um i believe it was the under the red hood re-release where they had like sergeant rock and all these like uh, yeah. little tales yeah. that were varying quality but at least you understood when you went in that they were all different stories this would have worked as an anthology series it would have worked mm -hmm. as episodes of a tv show but what it does not work as is a movie and while i won't say it's as bad as the other green lantern movie that was released in live action that year it came close by being a mess <laughs> what do you think wow so Again, this is just, I have to give it a very similar rating to what I gave Batman um, Gotham Knight, which is a sweet sour. I can't really, the only reason why I'm giving it the sweet is because again, those stories were good. Like some of them truly did have merit and some of them are really entertaining. Like I did love, I, Mogo doesn't socialize is probably one of the funniest things I've seen in terms <laughs> of like Green Lantern stories and superhero storytelling. And it didn't even involve a superhero that much. I just think that like, creating that urban legend of it is really cool um again i did like also like the first couple of stories like hearing about avra comic book wise he's actually not the first green lantern but he is created for this film i love that they were able to create something like that and like give give us a sense of like putting us into this world understanding how it started and then following it up with kilowog was like a nice touch but then I agree. Like the the main plot of the film, I, I felt whelmed. I'm <laughs> I have to use it. I felt whelmed because it really the movie is, as a whole falls short by the end of the last story and the, and the have the resolution of the main plot. Because for the last story, the Avan Sir one, you I, you need to know history of it. Like you need to know Green Lantern history to even get like the smallest details. Otherwise, it truly feels like a waste. You need to know if Sinestro does indeed betray the Green Lanterns. Um, I feel like as a casual viewer, you probably just decide to watch this film. You're not going to get some of the stuff that they reference. And even that like prophesized destruction of Oa, um, you know, like that seemed really random because it was like, I don't want to equate it to this, but it is very similar to it. It's like with Thor Ragnarok, where they like talked about Ragnarok in the beginning. We lost sight of it, but it was still kind of like talked about. And then we finally saw the unconventional way that it happened. Like we could, it, it felt like we just threw in the fact that like, oh, it was supposed to be destroyed five minutes before it was actually destroyed. Right. Absolutely right. Yeah, Ragnarok. If you... You know, if you look at Ragnarok, if you zoom out of it and you see mm. every plot point, every plot point is either about caught about like averting Ragnarok or causing it. So it's like when they mm. go to, for example, when they go to pick up Odin, 
that's because they came close to Ragnarok and Thor wants to make sure that it doesn't happen. So he needs to go get his father who is um, the best authority on it. And when his father dies, he unleashes Hela, which causes a need for Ragnarok. It mm-hmm. all flows into each other. And here, there is no consistent flow of Avra. I mean, not Avra. There's no consistent flow of Krona as a threat in the stories. There's no consistent mm-hmm. flow as to why Oa is so important. Mm-hmm. Really? Outside, at the beginning, they tell you Oa is important. But they could have used these stories to flesh out different parts of Oa and what Oa meant. You could have all you could set all these stories on Oa. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to really like impress upon the importance of sacrificing it. Because when Oa is destroyed, we feel nothing. Yeah. <laughs> they have a backup planet. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Destroy the planet. Who gives it? Like it is it, there's such a disconnect between the story that is supposedly supposed to link all these things together and these separate stories. Mm-hmm. So it wouldn't fix it. Honestly, to to do any RT alteration of adding uh, Chrono or anything, my RT alteration is to repack this movie as seven shorts and release them as such. Mm-hmm. And then you have like Green Lantern stories or anthology, and then we could braid it off of that. That simple change would make me like this movie a, a lot better. But as it is, no, <laughs> it's just yeah. a no for me. <laughs> Give yeah, me back I agree. The ring. Like, give me back the ring. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that this, um, I'm like picturing it in my head now. This would have been better served because one of the main things that does come up in terms of like um, in plot pieces was like the, uh, the book of Oa and how this book keeps track of all the history. Let it be that Hal Jordan is actually just reading stories to us about from the book of Oa. Don't let it be that like he's telling Aresia. Um, all this stuff that happened because one of the other things that happens is that now he turns into an unreliable narrator because like how does he know exactly what happened to Lyra how does he know exactly what happened to Kilowog and that whole thing with Deegan and Abin Sir like there's too much where it's just like it could feel like he's just throwing in random things to probably make it I I doubt he has access to all the mission reports or has has all of this knowledge in his head or even the fact that like why would Lyra even share her the story about what happened to Jade and how she had to fight and um, take down her father with Hal Jordan like it does not seem like something based off the way they've they've made put her like characterization it doesn't seem like something she would share at all with anybody unless it's in a mission report or somebody she's really close to and you don't get that sense of how close they are from the film. Yeah. And and that's another thing that also setting us up with Hal Jordan and not giving us any Hal Jordan, mm. especially Nathan Fillion, which is dream casting for Green Lantern. Mm-hmm. And to just have him as a glorified narrator that doesn't even really affect the end outcome of this plot is criminal it is criminal (laughs) it it, it's just it's baffling to me it would be like if they brought in andrew garfield for no way home and he shows up and he's like oh actually i'm gonna stay by and make bread with you know with um ned's grandma for the rest of this movie and then he comes back at the (laughs) end no that's not what we came here for so yeah that is also another disappointing aspect just no use of how whatsoever so other than that, like I have, I gave it the sweet sour just because like, I do love some of the stories that came out of it. Um, sour just because of the execution. Like, and I do like the fact that we got a chance to see so many different Green Lanterns and hear more about their stories. Um, Cause again, you know, we're praising Hal here now, but like um, you know, just the use of Nathan Fillion is Hal. But to be honest, I'd be fine if we didn't have Hal for a little second. Like, you know, like, you know, we, we have so many other Green Lanterns, as I mentioned, so it'd be great. To, this is why I was like, I like the idea of seeing more Green Lanterns. It just really wasn't executed well. I agree with you. Rele- re-release these into like several shorts, maybe even have it that it's just like someone's telling us these stories from the Book of Oa. Don't add on this additional plot because now it's just like we're along the, for the ride with Aresia, who... I'm pretty sure that after hearing all these stories in the middle of a crisis event, I'm, I would also be like, are we sure this is where we need to be focusing our attention now? Yeah. And I, I kind of 
Yeah, what exactly what you said too. I kind of would have preferred if you're not going to use Hal, don't even bring him. <laughs> don't even bring him here. <laughs> it, it would have been fine. Mm-hmm. All right, so that is um, Green Lantern Emerald Knights. Uh, that this film was actually really a joint effort of just trying to create new stories, I guess, really for the Green Lantern Corps um, because it's very similar to. Um, the story of ta- like the comic book series Tales of the Green Lantern Corps, where we do get a chance to see more of the Green Lanterns besides like Hal Jordan or those who are protecting Sector 2814, which is um, which consists of Earth. Um, so most of the stories are actually made specifically for this movie. Some of them are written by um, Peter J. Tomasi, Mark Guggenheim. You know, like there's a lot of heavy hitters when it comes to. Um, comic book writing and DC entertainment when it comes to these shorts that were produced. Um, I will share though that there were two that were actually based on actual comic book stories. And Andrew, if you had to guess, which two would you think they are? Um, I think. I mean, Kilowog seems right, and maybe the Lyra story. <laughs> <laughs> um nope those were our original screenplays for this film <laughs> oh god <laughs> the two that were originally comic book stories are our last two of the film mogul doesn't socialize and avin sir save save the best best for last <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they really had to because these stories were actually written by Alan Moore. Um, you know Alan Moore as the person who's written the, a lot of DC stuff, is, and especially for like Watchmen. Um, fun fact about Alan Moore, he does not like his name connected to any adaptation of any of his stories if they're put into um, television, film, or anything like that because he was upset that they've butchered it in the past. So he's like, if you're going to butcher my stuff, don't put my name on it. <laughs> That makes, I, I agree. <laughs> I 100% as an artist, I agree with that energy. <laughs> so uh, for our first story, Mogul Doesn't Socialize, it's actually an adaptation of the of a short story at the end of Green Lantern number 188 um, by Alan Moore again. It was illustrated by Dave Gibbons, which, whose name does pop up in the credits of our film. In that story, is all focusing on how, like, John Stewart doesn't want to wear his mask anymore and reveals his identity to the public, to much of the shock of Hal Jordan. But at the end, it actually wraps very similarly to how it does in our film, in which Aresia is learning about the history of the Green Lanterns by going through the Book of Oa. But then Tomar Ray shares with her about, um, about who Mogo is and how the reason why Mogo doesn't socialize in the comic, the real reason is that his gravitational pull would actually destroy Oa. So he had to keep his distance. But he is a Green Lantern. And then the other thing he does share is that Mogo is a powerful Green Lantern as he does share the Bofunga story. Once again, it is beat for beat, same thing. I really enjoyed, this is why I kind of enjoyed the, um, the, the, the one that we have in our film here, just because we got a chance to see a bit more of this story play out and the comicness of it. And, you know, the fact that it was Ra- Rowdy Rowdy Piper voicing Bofunga is kind of a cool <laughs> aspect to have. Like, we hardly ever have a wrestler that gives his voice to an animated DC character. Um, so, yeah, this is basically beat for beat the same story um, written by Alan Moore. And then it was followed up by another Alan Moore story from 1986. This is adapted from the second annual Tales of the Green Lantern Corps. It's a lot like our movie here where there's like a larger story taking place within these smaller stories being shared. And it's from the story called Tigers, which he um, wrote alongside the illustrations of Kevin O'Neill. And it's the same thing. Avin Sir meets a captive on Ismalt. Instead of it being Atrocitus, it's actually another person by the name of Quill. Um, that mention of Atrocitus being a, member, being a member of the five inversions is actually just pulled dialogue from this comic. And these are demonic-like beings that were part of Sector 666. That is not a joke. That is actually what the number <laughs> is. <laughs> and they were unfairly destroyed um, and massacred by the Manhunters, the Guardians' first line of defense before they created the Green Lantern Corps, as we learned about in the uh, what was it called? The the Blackest Night episode, I think, from Justice League, the one with Greenland. With yeah, it sounds about right. Yeah. 
So they basically did the same thing. And in that, um, Atrocitus, not just, sorry, not Atrocitus, Quill, much like Atrocitus, shares with Adam Sir these prophecies. He doesn't share, though, about Oa's destruction. He doesn't share about Sinestro turning evil. The only thing that he shares is that um, Adam Sir will die. He will die soon, and that his ring will be given to Hal Jordan, who will become the greatest Green Lantern. And but it's done in a very menacing way, and this is where Avin Sir is just he doesn't have that conversation about luck and destiny because Sinestro doesn't even pop up. Instead, Avin Sir kind of falls into more of a self preservation mode. He's having conversations with his ring about, well, he's asking the ring straight, straight up, like, will you ever fail me? And the ring's like, no, this won't happen. Like, you're not going to get to the point where I don't have enough power to save you from something. So, but Abin decides like, you know what? I'm going to take some precautions. I'm going to start taking a different mode of transportation. I'm going to um, start charging my ring a bit more before missions. And he's even questioning the rings. They ask him, he's like, hey, do you need to be charged? Can I charge you now? And the ring's like, nah, you're good. Um, eventually, though, as we know the story, Avin Sir does die during the plane crash um, and where he meets up with Hal Jordan. And this is because despite having his ring charged, despite having the mode of transportation that he felt safe, he fell into yellow radiation. As we know, Green Lanterns don't like the color yellow, and the radiation knocked out the ring, so he was unable to protect himself, leading to his death and the basically the rest of the story's history. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that works as a big long thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> works as a full story. Yeah, I I do appreciate the fact that the movie kind of cut it down a bit and tried to like lean into more of the historical comic book fandom stuff that we know of. Like this changed my mind about Ivan Sir, to be honest. Like I I feel like we've always talked about Ivan Sir, or at least like heard about Ivan Sir as like this like super cool dude that just died. Um, <laughs> That's all I know about him before. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we have no idea what he's done, who he saved, none of his story. But now it kind of like um, adds a bit of characterization, personal, like personal, like makes him a bit more human a little bit. Um, but yeah, that is the two comics that ended up being adapted into our film. Everything else was just um, screenplays that were written for the film. Um, it's still a lot. Green Lantern Emerald Knights is a lot, especially for runtime at 84 minutes. So like, I hear you. It's... It's like you would only really enjoy it if you probably have seen it more than once and know what to, know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah, I I I did not. So <laughs> <laughs> I found myself totally unprepared, and uh, I found out <laughs> that uh, <laughs> how this is going to be later on. And uh, yeah, I I wasn't really too happy with the result. I'm sorry. I mean, this is the second Green Lancer film that has failed you. <laughs> yeah, I I will say it, one day I hope we can cover First Flight. I hear that's a slight. I hear there's a linear story, so <laughs> I would love to go back and and see if that one has uh has some weight, has the constructs to impress me. Okay, okay, yeah, we'll do it. But first, we do need to hop back into our sweet and sour line of dcau films as we are going to talk about our next film because i know you love your prep time we do a lot of prep work for this podcast but the only person who beats us in prep time is batman oh yes and we're going to see the best of his skills in justice league doom next week all the justice leaguers are here it's not just batman and superman but it'll go back to that later on but right now it's all the <laughs> justice league so get ready for an exciting adventure all right and until then take care of yourselves and remember that let those who worship evils might fear your power and if the green lantern's light is on a planet that you can't find the green lantern on you're already dead I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.